so far with the NSIC, um, Ghana Research Mentorship Program. I'm really, really excited about today um, and about our panel who would be speaking to us. It's really, really an honor to, to have them both um, on here with us. I know how busy they both are, but then they made, made um, a time to come and speak with us. Um, so without much ado, I'll just start um, with the updates. My name is Theophilus, I'm chair of Incision Ghana. And um, so far it's been four months since we started and I'm, I'm really excited about how far we've come. There are little steps, but then we're making, we're making uh, progress. So since March, we've uh, successfully made, um, matched 44 mentees to, to mentors and they had at various um, stages in their project work. Um, for those on the waiting list, we had close to 300 people on the waiting list. We um, shut off in the short gap, decided to um, group them into um, groups of six to eight to undertake systematic reviews according to BI areas of interest. So far we have 23 groups and uh, these are the um, various areas in which they will be undertaking the systematic uh, reviews and uh, meta-analysis. The um, as of today would be completing a course online um, on systematic review and meta-analysis by John Hopkins. And then we would um, take it from there. This is a, a short of timeline for them. All right, I'm really excited uh, to come to the main course of the day. And we have Miss Alice Chai, who I've had the privilege of working personally with um, in 2019 and 2020. She has been an immense help to me, helped me several times with academic um, work. And I'm really, really, really excited that um, she has made time to be here with us. And so I would give her the platform to introduce herself and then we'll come to um, Professor Daniel Anson. Uh, thank you, Teddy. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Great, and you can see, I can't see myself. So, um, uh, and surely may I share my screen as well, please? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, right, let me share screen. Um, can you see my first page? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Teddy. It's been an honor to um, to be invited. Um, and truly, I've, I'm no worthy. I'm still learning in this process of doing research. Um, but my background is um, I am a upper GI um, senior registrar in my last year of training in the UK based in London, um, Hammersmith Hospital at the moment. And I spend um, three years out of program um, to do my PhD. We usually spend three years that doesn't count through to our training and then one year of write up. Um, and through that, um, uh, I obtained my PhD at Imperial, continue to do research um, since. Um, and Teddy's asked me to, to talk about how to write a research protocol. I very much hope this would be um, a, I was hoping this will be an interactive kind of session in that please do feel to chip in. I am gonna ask some questions um, uh, and maybe the um, Teddy, you can facilitate in, in the answers. If you're a bit too shy, put it into the chat box. And um, if you're willing to speak up, it'll be great to hear your voices. But we're gonna talk about how to write a research protocol. And it really is the beginning of establishing your idea. It is the time where you put your mind and your ideas down and, and somehow for some others to understand where you come from. It is the beginning of establishing, establishing your re research and having someone concurring to it. It's actually really important. It helps you shaping your mind, frame of mind, 
and testing out whether your hypothesis may, may or may not be correct. So in chat box, type yes if you have written a research protocol um, in the past. Um, I can't actually, I'm gonna try to see whether I can see the chats. Um, if not, I can't see a, with my screen, uh, maybe Teddy, you could um, tell me, oh, maybe I can see it. Uh, let me see chat. Yeah, keep going. I'm sure you all know how to use chat, chat box. Yes, yes, yes. Three yeses so far. You can write no if you haven't. Good, no, yes. There's more people than there's, come on. No, okay. At the moment, kind of 50 50. Keep going. Yeah. I'm getting okay. to. Good. So, we've got, so I know that I'm, some people may benefit from this, some people may not, uh, and feel free to share your opinion. Okay, so yeah, keep coming, it's okay, but 50-50 so far. Which kind of meant, Teddy, you know, on track, to, some, some people should be starting writing their protocol now. <laughs> I agree, um, I agree. <laughs> or, 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 you know, in the process of, um, so hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll be useful. Okay, so I have no disclosure um, doing as, uh, as my passion uh, to teach, um, but I have no um, uh, disclosure to make in here. Great, so I think we can close that chat about research, whether you've done research protocol. The first question I have to you is, why do we write a research protocol? Is anyone willing to turn on your mic and speak up? Or again, you can type in a chat box. Why bother? Why are we writing a research protocol? Why don't we just chat to friends and, um, and start experimenting or, or doing some research? Even a systematic review, why do we bother writing a protocol? What is it really for? At least some, I, yeah, anyone? If someone is speaking, I can't hear I think you. Someone but... is trying to speak up. Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, go on, Abdul Rashid. Yep. Good evening. Yeah, so I think the research protocol I've written from what I've learned for is like is to draw the framework of the what do you call it around the hypothesis you have and knowing which questions to ask for the right answers you are looking yeah. for in your research. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so sh sh shaming, shaping a framework. Anyone else? Feel free to just turn on your mic and if, you, uh, if your mic does, doesn't work, put it in the chat box. I'd like to know what you think why writing a research protocol is not just the thing that your research, your, your supervisor tells you to write. Not, not even a chat box. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I think it's yeah, also helps as a guide. It helps as a guide um, yes. throughout yes. your, your, your research project. Um, to be able to know what methodology you want to actually use, and it, it helps to streamline your work. Yeah. Okay. So let me just go back to my slide. Oops, sorry. So the you're absolutely right. The first two, you've got it all right. You're framing the research question, and by writing it down on a piece of paper, um, it challenges your mind and allows someone else to challenge your mind. It focuses the methodology that you're going to use. We'll come to examples later on. Retrospective, prospective, quantitative, qualitative. Um, what is the questions that you're going to ask? In the research protocol, you will also include what kind of analysis you're going to um, use to be appropriate to the, the uh, 
questions you, you want to answer. Funny enough, research protocol is actually essential and important, uh, and I'm not entirely sure of the regulation in Ghana, but certainly in the UK, the ethics approval takes much longer than the actual, uh, most of the time takes it long, much longer the, than the actual uh, study. A lot of ethics approval takes up six months up to a year. Um, and in the research, research protocols is essential when you want to apply for um, um, ethics. Um, it also helps you to present this to stakeholders. What does that mean? Well, research costs money. So um, from being a, just a medical student or a junior resident, you want your senior registrars or consultant to buy in. And for that, you give them your research protocol to show. At the same time, at the level of um, research uh, units, it, when they want to ask for funding, from other places, they show the research protocol. So from the down at the bottom of the basic foundation of framing the research question to the end of asking for money, resources, research protocol is the, the foundation of what is required. Um, and having that in mind, what do you think needs to be, sorry, this is the um, example of our uh, IRAS platform. And uh, it is a platform that we use when we have to apply for um, ethics approval that needs to be uh, reviewed nationally. It's a 56, at least 56 pages of forms to fill. And all the, the electronic forms of the, the components can actually be found in all the research protocol. So essentially, I'm showing you the importance of a research protocol in actually conducting studies that requires ethics approval as well as um, requiring funding. So bearing that in mind, um, what do you what do you include? What so so what do you have to include in the research protocol? Um, again, put in the chats, speak up, please. Uh, um, or maybe for the people who wrote yes, like I'm going to name them. You don't have to be the one who answers like Emmanuel, uh, sorry, Dominic, um, uh, Philomena, or who, who else says yes, um, e uh, Enoch. Um, for those who says yes, what did you include in your research protocol? Anyone? Um, Someone says the someone's, yeah. working title. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 I said a sample. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What else is there? Maybe um, is anyone, I don't really want to pick people because it's really nice to just be friendly. We are a collaboration, a fun, friendly group that have to meet on a Friday evening. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe someone to just speak up on what did you include in your research protocol? Uh, maybe Dominic, are you there online? Hello, I'm here. Hey, sorry for picking you. <laughs> your your name's the easiest to pronounce for me. <laughs> What did you what did you put in your what what did you put in your research protocol? Can you share your experience with us? Okay, so um, as I as I said earlier, I began with my working title and also um, introduction and a little background into the research um, I was going to undertake, and as well as um, justification, and then move to my research questions, then um, went on to have my objectives both um, general and specific objectives, then the methodology that I was going to use. Yeah. And went. Great, thank you. It's really helpful actually to listen to what you have put into your research protocol because that then helps me to focus on the things that you don't, you guys may not normally put in or, or considered. Um, I just will ask one more, someone can volunteer or I'll just scroll down, I'll give, 
uh, chance anyone wants to share what they put in their research protocol can be the same. How about um, Philomena Namali? Are you there? Yeah. Hi, thank yeah. you. Sorry. Yeah, tell me, what did you put for your research okay. protocol? Um, to add to what um, Dominic said, um, you, that, um, you can also include um, like your sample size. And then if um, you have to um, ask for permission or um, do some ethical, consideration you also include all that to um help you um have your research protocol yeah yeah perfect thank you so much uh let me okay so um you're all absolutely right so the the research protocol needs to have um a title page so i'm giving you an example of the research protocol um, i wrote in 2015 um, for my phd and on the right side so the first page is the title i think maybe what you guys have been focused on is the actual research methodology that you are using in a protocol which is very fair um and uh forgive this session is not um I'm not going to go into details of how to, what the difference between aim and objectives are, um, what's, what kind of, how many types of studies are there, what statistical analysis do you make, do you use for, for continuous, or this is not a topic of teaching you research methodology, but it's a very practical view of how to write a protocol. So um, the first thing you do is who, the, of course your title, who is your chief investigator, principal investigator? Now, you may be the one who's doing most of the work, but the person who is the chief investigator is the one who's responsible. So it could be um, your professor, um, it could be your consultant. Normally the principal investigator and chief investigator would be the one when you do write a paper, be the last in your authorship. The one who's overseeing everything is responsible for for any um, outcomes for this. Uh, so this, this is the first thing you need to establish. Now, a real re a research protocol goes through many amendments, and so if you start writing a research protocol, start to keep aversions to it because things do change, and and uh, and without knowing, it will be uh, the sample size and things will be different. And why is it important to keep versions to it? Because you may be applying an ethics approval of version five, for example, and it get turned back down and you need to change it to version six. Have a good habit to keep versions. Um, and, and these versions are basically the times when you're re it's reviewed by someone already, your supervisor or your, the ethics committee, and you change it again. So these are versions and dates, and you can see that this, my research protocol has a ver is version five. It does go up to, to six and seven, depending on how big this, this research is. Um, so that's the first thing. Then actually, funny enough, what people really need to know is who is sponsoring this and who is funding this? You can have the best idea, um, but the, it it is important for for the funders or for for people who even as a the participant, they want to know that is your research that they are participating sound. Is it going to generate data? Is it worth for them donating or giving their their time? or tissue samples or blood products, some of them get given medication. Do you, is this a sound um, um, uh, research question that's being challenged? Who's funding this? So, and that's probably something that you, you guys haven't mentioned so far, but it's very important to know who's actually study coordinating center, who's the st study management group, and which means who's the chief and co, co uh, investigators. Um, I mentor um, two of um, uh, the candidates here and the first and within the second session what I did was I give them an example of my research protocol with this format and and I'm sure everywhere else has different format but 
these are things to include normally in in a UK when when you need to submit for someone to review it. Contact detail normally it would be the person who's who's responsible for this. Um, so this is really important. Then we're going into this this the, the first page. So again, please don't feel this is the one way of doing the only way of doing it. But normally people want to know just a summary. So it's like an abstract where it's just one page. Tell me what the title is. What are your aims? What are the um, what was so what is the objectives and what are the outcome measures and how long are you going to spend your projected spending time on, on this pro, uh, on this project and in a lot of project that requires um samples or analysis of tissues or products they, they were actually or interventions to patient they will ask you to break down one by one of what each encounter means for example, the patient needs to come into outpatient clinic. That's one. The patient needs to have a blood sample taken. That's two. The sample needs to send to the lab. That's three. Um, and the lab needs to have certain things done. How does it come back? And they, they may ask you to break down specifically how many times does each element take. And then some will ask you, and certainly in IRAS, is how much do you predict each one is going to be? So um, it does go into quite a lot of details, but the first page um, will be really useful just to give a summary. Um, we're gonna go into a real example uh, and I don't wanna take too much time, um, but you're right. The first thing is literature review, research aim, specific objectives. We all mentioned that um, already. And then is the design and methodology. So number one page was the abs kind of overview. Number two is your introduction, your rationale behind. Number three is your research design methodology that would include your inclusion, exclusion criteria, statistical analysis. Um, and then number four is the regulatory issues. And maybe regulatory issues is something that um, I see I see so far that that we're we are we are not really mentioning in this group. So something that when you speak to your supervisor or mentor in this group um, to ask them more about in Ghana, please do educate me. Um, do things go through ethics approval? Uh, Teddy, do 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 they do research go through ethics approval in Ghana? Yes, 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 they do. Okay. Um I'm I'm sure you and then there's a local ethics committee. And there's also National Ethics Committee in the UK. And then that actually break down to how you're going to consent the patient. And in, in our um, ethical um, submissions, we actually have to have that already with um, the, the consent forms, patient information sent uh, leaflet, um, all in one package. How do you, uh, how do you maintain confi confidentiality? Uh, and you'll come to an example, you actually have to write something like, I will put these paper into a, a, a box that will sit in this office that'll be locked away. Um, and in 10 years time, we will destroy the papers. That's the details that they, they want. And how is your quality control and quality assurance in your study? So um, are these data you're gonna collect trans, transfer, sorry, um, transparent, who are you going to allow people to come and examine your data collection? And um, again, we talked about sponsor and fun funding. So let me share um, an, a real example of uh, an ethics approval. Any questions so far um, whilst I'm changing this, the screen? We will look up out for it on the chat and then uh, feedback to you. That'll be great. Thank you. Um, I did open. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing and then go back to sharing. Uh, how do I share? Maybe I'll just go into my desktop. Apolo apologize if you see some, you know, <laughs> photos of my kids and so on. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example of a study we conducted um, 
And it was actually a, a, MS, a master's degree um, I was supervising with my, uh, my own supervisor, but we are supervising a study uh, that trying to validate a novel simulator called Symbol, Symbol Box. Um, and please do, do try not to take a screenshot. I'm sure it's fine because it's been submitted to the ethics committee, but I wasn't sure the implication of, of showing it. Um, but um, so this, this is showing you read time. This is version five. You can see we are still amending it. This was 2016. Um, and the aim of this was to um, test whether this novel simulator symbol box, does it um, improve laparoscopic suturing? So uh, does anyone want to put in a chat or tell me what kind of things to consider? Um, how would you design such a study? Knowing that we're talking methodology, what kind of samples, who do you want to involve or include? Uh, so someone wrote in a group, is there a word or page limit in writing a research protocol? And um, the answer to that question from for, for my unit is no. But the, but the research protocol is not a um, it's, it's not a paper, published paper and it's certainly not a thesis. So um, it needs to be succinct. And your and your supervisor should should know. Um, OK, great. So some someone's wrote fine. Okay, no, so I don't want to overrun the time. It's already half, nearly half past. Nobody is, is, is answering my question. So I'm just going to run through them and please do shout out. So what we did was, um, obviously the main sponsor was in Imperial College. It's important we highlighted the coordinator center was actually a surgical skills unit. Um, I was the co-investigator. My supervisor was um, the um, chief investigator. Our MS BSc students was the co it's the third co-investigator then. And then it's exactly what we did. So introduction and study background. I think we probably don't need to go into too much detail because everybody has different, um, a different study to carry out. But research aim, as I said, number three is research design and methodology. So we talked about what's our recruitment procedure. We're gonna use our core training trainees in CT1 and CT2. Uh, what are they going to be doing? They begin allocated into two groups. We're going to compare the people who are using uh, a novel simulator trainer set and the one with conventional training set. And how we're going to measure their um, skills uh, acquisition. We use um, what symbol box can provide, which is the overall, overall time, the movement, angular movement, um, and then we video them to watch them to, to assess their competencies. What's our inclusion exclusion criteria? It was a very short um, summer, kind of a three, two, three months project for BSc students. So all we wanted was 20 participants, may not be the accurate sample size. It, 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 this was a pilot study for, for this particular symbol box uh, uh, product. Let's look at the regulatory issue. So, because this is what we or we're not so familiar with, uh, we we had to submit it to our own local ethics approval. So this was approved by our the head of research in at Imperial, um, and this is a, a very standard what we write. So that we have con the consent information leaflet has been obtained, and these are all collected and and kept. Um, we talk about we everything will be confidential. Um, no identifiable information will, will be um, hand, handled. Um, we also talk about that if the um, relevant data, if the patient or the candidates want to retrieve from the study at any point, he, they will be fine to do so um, with no kind of uh change in, in how we treat them essentially so the talk about withdrawal we talk about indemnity who is if for example a student so a, a trainee comes and do the symbol box and have some kind of eye strain or or arm hurting their arm or something we've got to cover that um of 
those very small things, these harms, we have insurance policy to, to do so if anyone wants to sue, sue um, the, the study. Um, and how do we come to the quality? Um, because we are experienced and it's been the best possible way it's been kept. We talk about how to assess the risk. We talk about the posture. <laughs> These are really silly, actually, if you think about it, but, but it is actually important to address. Eye strains, muscle fatigue, tiring from using the simulator, um, optimized posture. These things, how do they report if there's a complaint? Um, serious adverse event, what happens? So let's say if two out of the four trainees use it and their laparoscopic skills in real life deteriorated significantly, this study needs to be closed. This kind of silly things in this setting, but important, very important for other um, research. Sponsor and funding, um, how do we audit the, the, the data accuracy? How, what are you going to do with the outcome? How are we going to publish? Contingency plan is the what we're going to do if there is adverse um, or risks. To... So you'll, you'll find that actually a research protocol, your mind and soul is all on how about how to conduct this your 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 methodology. But half of the research protocol is on management um, and ethics. I hope that's been useful. I've taken half half an hour already without even trying hard. Um, there's a lot to cover. Um, I I have shared my protocol with um, my two uh, mentees. Um, if Teddy, if you're if you wish to have a copy of it, I can I can amalgamate and give you a, a protocol that we often use uh, as a standard, and we can I can send it to Teddy and to distribute to you. Any questions? All right. Um, I think there's a question. Yeah. I'm using deep machine. Thank you, Raphael. Um, I'm using deep machine learning in my research. However, how can we validate such time of models, please? I mean, the data I collected to train the machine and the final model actually like proving their clinical functionality. Um, so that's a research question uh, and um, happy to discuss um, outside as well. But in real machine learning, well, first of all, I'm hoping that you've got, you already are within a sound research unit with experts in IT and uh, as, as well as AR and AI. Uh, and I'm sure you have supervisors that can help you, but um, you you have to find something else in, in validating. Now, validating has different type of valid, validity. So when you validate something, there's construct validity, there's um, phase validity, there is, uh, so, you, so you need to work out what are you actually trying to validate. If you're gonna validate in seeing is it clinical value, then you need to find something that's a gold standard in clinical value. Let's say if you're, doing a CT colon and you're, you're doing a machine learning on whether CT colon pick up polyps for cancer, then your gold standard is colonoscopy. So, so you would train your AI machine to look at CT colon, and then you have to compare that to the colonoscopy value to see is your AI ag accurate. That's a, that's a short answer to this. Happy to discuss, but I'm not expert in machine learning. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, so um, systematic review, why is it important? Um, well, you're right, you don't need ethics approval for systematic review. Um, depending on whether you are doing systematic review and a um, meta-analysis, uh, it's more important, it's not important for just systematic review on its own meta-analysis. Yes, so if you imagine research protocol to be something, when you write research protocol, it actually forms the first half of your paper when you're going to publish. You're going to describe your methodology. How do you, how, how do you come up with the search terms? Because that's going to be the important, the people are going to look at is your search terms 
value uh, correct? How do you select? What's your inclusion exclusion criteria? You're right. So therefore, there's no regulatory and ethics issues. But writing a research protocol just helps you frame that mindset and then present to your um, supervisor on whether these the, the, the terms you chose, the methodology, there's still a methodology to use, especially in meta-analysis. Um, are they sound? But you're right, a simple re systematic review does not require a protocol. Anything else? Great, um, Teddy, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, for sharing. Also your time and knowledge. Yes, I'm on call. I'm on night, actually. I just finished uh, handover. Great. Um, yes, I'll leave it to Doc, Doc House to introduce um, Prof. Anson. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you very much, very guys. Much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll, it's with much honor I will be introducing Professor Ansel. Um, Professor Daniel Ansel is currently um, the Dean of the School of Medicine and uh, Medical Sciences of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He's a fellow of the West African College of Physicians and the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. And until his appointment as the Dean of SMS, he was the Deputy um, Director of Research and Development at CAT, a, a position he held for six years. He's also the head of the Pediatric Emergency Unit of CAT for 10 years. And um, Prof. Anson has on several um, occasions acted as the Medical Director of the Kovanoti Teaching Hospital. His leadership approach has um, been found to be shaped by evidence-based decision process, proactiveness, and forward-looking team building and cooperativeness. And he has served as an investigator in several pivotal uh, malaria clinical trials in Ghana. And currently is the principal investigator in the phase three ma malaria vaccine clinical trial currently taking place in Ghana. In addition to his research interest in malaria, he is working with World Health Organization and Africa region in the African region, um, AFRO, on pediatrics, uh, sepsis, and meningitis surveillance program, for which he is the lead clinician. He's an investigator in the Austria Environment uh, Consortium for en Enhanced Sepsis Outcomes, um, ASESO, um, study in CAT. And he has spent over two decades in the care of sickle cell disease patients and has, has been a key investigator in the Sickle Cell Pan-African Research Consortium and SPACO Network. And not only is he a researcher, he, is, he has a lot of interest. I really admire that interest in research and building capacity in Ghana. And without um, further I do, I would um, like to invite a answer to that. Right, thank you very much. And um, I think it's a good opportunity to have me on this program. I'm, I'm, I'm very much happy to be a mentor for the team of uh, mentees that you have given me. And um, I would want to continue on from where Alice en ended on the, the issue on, on protocols and proposals. Um, as we in the health um, arena, you would notice that whatever we do um, in our clinical practice is based on evidence, is based on what research has revealed, what research questions and answers that has come out is what we are using it to practice. And as we continue to practice medicine, then there will be the need to also continue to research into areas and come out with innovative ways of, of managing cases and managing systems within our health institutions. Um, I'm looking at the common mistakes that we make when we are writing the research protocol or research proposal. And when you look at the, 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 the name proposal or protocol, 
A protocol is, is a document that um, is, is, is written such that if one does a research and another person would want to replicate that same research and maintain the standards, then it's this document that would, would be used. And it's like a working document that would enable you to even replicate the same thing. Or if you want to vary, then you would have something to base on. So it's like the standards that you, the research person, would want to use to answer a certain research question. Now, we, we tend to submit protocols and proposals to funding agencies for funding agencies to um, provide funding. However, we, we, we fail to do the right thing that would enable the funding agencies um, support us. Um, I would, would want you to keep your questions and you can even jump in and ask questions as I go through um, some few um, slides and then we'll do, put the rest into discussions. Now, um, I think my background is, is known. I'm a pediatrician, I'm currently the Dean of the School of Medicine and Dentistry and also doing malaria and vaccine research into malaria as well as other research support for the World Health Organization. Now, um, I would look at some of the common mistakes in the proposal writing, discuss how to avoid these mistakes and the funding agencies that sometimes we would submit our proposals to for funding. Now, I have no disclosures and some of the images that I would be showing here are not my own creation. And um, they were images that um, I imported from the web wide web. Right, so um, what, what are some of the issues that we will be dealing with? We have common mistakes. The research topic itself can, can, can be a problem. And so when you write in, or if you have a research area that you would want to research to, or you have a research question, then your research question, usually we would want your topic to have some bit of resemblance to your research topic. So in developing your research, if you have a broad, research topic, usually you, you are unable to, to go through. So for instance, we, we are in the era of COVID-19, so you would want to um, give an example of a research topic to say, I would want to investigate um, COVID-19 outcomes in, 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 in the population of Ghanaians living in the Upper West region. It's, it is too broad, even though you have some specificities in it that you want an area within Ghana, but someone can just say, I want to investigate COVID-19 outcomes without even specifying the time period, without even looking at which category of individuals is doing that. You may have to justify your research topic. And this comes in your introduction and the background that Alice mentioned to give us what are the scientific evidence for you to go to this, um, to do this research. If you do not have enough scientific evidence, if you don't have a, able to establish the clinical equipoise, then there's no need for you to go in, your, your, your proposal would, would be rejected. That would mean that you must do a lot of literature review, a lot of research work in the area and read about what others have done and what are the gaps. It is your research that is going to fill those gaps. So if you're unable to justify the research gap, then your research topic, your research area may not be the area to go. She mentioned aims, objectives, research questions. The aims, the objectives, and the research questions, or the research question, the aims on the objectives, they must line up. If you do not have them lined up, and you would have the aim and a different research question, and you have an objective and a different research question, you would have problems with your, your proposal. The study methodology. For instance, we know we have qualitative research design, quantitative research design, and we have the mixed method. There are certain research questions that your best approach is to be based on a very good theoretical foundation that for this research question, you think that it's a qualitative work that would reveal the true information to be able to answer a research question. On the other hand, there are some research questions that you would have to do a, a quantitative um, research method. A typical example, if you would want to assess the hemoglobin levels of school children, 
who are living in a malaria endemic area and find out the prevalence of malaria in this population that have an impact on their hemoglobin levels. You, you probably will be doing something quantitative. However, if you want to understand the behavior and the practices in the use of bed nets and its impact on the hemoglobin levels of children, then you will realize that you need a mixed method because you're looking at behavior, attitude, and practice. And so there may be the need to do some observations, to be able to do a bit of focus group discussions, the means of to do some in-depth interviews, to be able to understand their practices. And so if you write your proposal with a very weak theoretical foundation, you would have problems with the proposal. And these are some of the mistakes that we do. Now, with regards to the design, um, you would want to structure your work that from point A to point B, this is what I'll do. From point B to point C, this is what I do. These are the instruments that I'm going to use. These instruments have these characteristics. This is how the instruments were calibrated. And this is how I'm going to ensure that the specificity and the sensitivity of the instruments are okay throughout the research process. We would want to see all these documentations. The design also would have to be directed to which population, what are your inclusion criteria, your exclusion criteria, what sample size are you considering, how are you estimating the sample size, what sampling method are you using, and why are you using that sampling method? You need to justify all this. This is important because at the end of the day, your protocol or your proposal Someone will say, these findings, let me do the same study using the same methodology, using the same design, and see whether I'm, I'm going to get the same results. Once that is done, then the, you can, the person can walk through your proposal without you directing him. And so whenever you read your research design, you should ask yourself, can someone take my research design and do the same work? and would not have to even call me to ask, Pierre, what did you mean by this approach? That is an important information for us. Now, the writing style. The writing style is very important. We usually recommend that the, the active voice of writing should be used. And there are several online sources that you can go to have a um, training on how to improve on the writing style. And there may, I would recommend that there should be sections on how to do the writing style because if the writing style is not so good, it also affects the review process. The planning, how do you plan your project? What goes into it? Who are the project managers? And she, she said it, in your submitting even to the ethics committee, they would want to see how the project is being planned. The reason why the planning, the design is important is because of the ethical considerations. You cannot subject research participants into a research and at the end of the day, because of the poor design, because of the weak methodology, you will have weak results and your results cannot be used. And you, in that case, you've wasted the research participants time and that is on ethical. It brings us to the section of ethical considerations. The common mistakes that we do is that we write the research proposal and we do not pay attention to what are the research implications or the ethical implications to the patient? Safety, well-being, the benefits. And in the area of even informed consent, we need to pay attention to it. It should be clearly stated what are the critical ethical issues within the study, such that you would be able to convince your funding agency that you're not doing anything that is harmful to your study population bearing in mind the harm that some research um, okay, um, did to patients some years ago. Your budget justification should be very clear. A study that is poorly budgeted is unethical because you recruit patients, you subject them to certain exposures and you are unable to complete the project because you do not have enough budget. That is really unethical. So the reviewers will look at your budget, your budget estimations and would be able to say whether your project or your study can be conducted or not. 
what are some of the common mistakes? So if you want to find, avoid this, first of all, what is the purpose of the grant call that requires your proposal? If the grant call is in COVID, it's in HIV, it's in tuberculosis, don't put a proposal that is looking at something on infectious disease that is not related to that area. If it's a non-communicable disease, make sure you, you work towards non-communicable disease. And you, I will show you some of the calls that usually come. So they are usually very specific and, and they, they tell you what they want. What we fail to do is finding time to read the entire grant call to find out what it is that the funding agency would want and what research questions that you would want to ask. Invariably, they tend to give us what research questions that they would want you to answer for you to come out with a very good research question, for you to come out with a very good research topic, then your aim, your objectives would follow. What is the research area the funding agency is interested in? If you go online, you would find out that some research agencies are only interested in non-communicable disease. Some are interested in communicable disease, and then you work towards them. You follow their guidelines and their directives carefully. The, the guidelines are always in depth. For NIH, the NIH grants, you probably would have to devote about two and a half to three hours, sometimes leave it and come back to the core instructions and read it carefully over the time. It's most of the time, if you are alone, you are unlikely to skip several key areas within the grant core. It is therefore very important, and I would recommend that for grant applications or for proposals and protocols, you probably would have to form a team because each and every team member has its own qualities that will bring on board to enable you um, successfully apply for, for the grant. Again, identify the interests of the funding agency. Keep in mind that your proposal will be reviewed by experts in the area. The proposals we send, there are other experts across the globe that would look at it. So if you send in a working team to tuberculosis, after your team had done that, do a local peer review, present it to your local um, institution for them to even do a peer review on your proposal before you send it out, because then it goes to the real experts who are asking the questions. Is this research proposal going to answer a research question that would fill a certain research gap? And is the planning adequate? Is the team well prepared to do that? I, I forgot to talk about the research team here. If you're doing work on, let's say, tuberculosis in adults, a longitudinal study, your research team should comprise of physicians who are respiratory physicians, who are pulmonologists, you probably would have to take some x-rays so you should have some individuals with imaging background. If it's a study that has, that needs counseling, you need counselors on the study because you know tuberculosis is stigmatized. And so you need um, counselors on the study. You would need a pharmacologist on the study because they are on anti-tuberculosis drugs and someone in, with interest in that. So your research team should be very comprehensive. Most of the time, you may have a very good proposal and the negative areas that the reviewers would write is that we don't believe the study team is capable of conducting the study because they don't have the enough team. We tend to leave out the statisticians. We tend to leave out the epidemiologists. So you need to form a network. Current research direction is network, consortia, that does the research work. It's not a group of one or two persons in a corner wanting to answer a certain research question and want to use just their two names. Meanwhile, they, would, they are not statisticians. They are not epidemiologists. They don't, they don't know how to cancel. They don't have pharmacology background. They are, there is no pharmacologist on there. And you, you therefore need to sit down and plan your research team very well. That is the angle that research is going. Now, in order to help you avoid some of these mistakes. There are certain very key um, online sources where you can find enough information. The Equator Network is a very good network that trains and guide um, 
to young research persons. And even we also have to go there and, and upgrade ourselves, actually. And they enhance the quality of research and brings transparency into what we, we do. What it is that they have. If you go to the website, if you are contemplating on writing a proposal on randomized control trial, an observational study, on a systematic review, and even writing a study protocol, a diagnostic um, um, research work, a case report, a clinical practice guidelines, a qualitative research, and those even in the veterinary background would go here and they would give you all the various guidelines as to what it is should come into your research protocol. Because it's the research protocol and the results that is going to be published. And the publishing outline should follow this. If it's a randomized control trial, then you are looking at the consult guidelines. If it's an observational study, you are looking at the STROBI. Systemic reviews, you are looking at the PRISM, and so on and so forth. You need to visit this website and understand what it is your research question is, what it is your research design is, and which of these reporting guidelines that you need to mirror with your proposal, such that at the end of your study, you may not be found wanting because you have left some key guidelines reporting information in your research work. They, 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 they train. They, 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 they support research capacity building. So some of the toolkits within this website will be the research, writing the research, selecting the appropriate reporting guidelines, peer reviewing of research work. And then I've said, do an institutional peer review and do a peer review before you submit it to the funding agency. And this is the site that I would recommend. Again, there is another, website writing center it is, is there is a george mason university it's a very important website that you would find the imrad um, writing styles and how to do the writing style and write very well and you would find a lot of resources in this area at this point i would want to hold on if there are any questions in the chat box so that i, I can address them Okay, so I've seen someone um, put the, the equator network guidelines in the end. Right, so so yes, um, on, the, on the question of why the research, hello? Yes, Abdul, coming. Good evening, bro. First yes. of all, thank you for your time or given as a guidance. Um, my first question has to do with the ethical concern. Right. And since you are a pediatrician, especially in children, and mm. also working in Ghana, you are probably, most of us are going to work in areas whereby the mothers who are usually the ones who bring the children to the hospital are not that well educated to understand what research is. So in terms of gaining consent, how do you go about it? And also, um, in how ethical is it to take blood samples from children, since children are also already afraid of injections and those stuff, for research work and those stuff? Right, so, yeah. so, so, so doing research in children is a different category. You, you would notice that currently the, in, in research guidelines, there are three categories of children or, or, or individuals, let me say. There are children and the adolescents and they are the adults. The adults are capable of taking, have, um, giving informed consent or having informed consent or making informed decision to be able to conduct the, the research work on them. In an adolescent, you may have to get the assent from the adolescent as well as the consent from the parents. And this should be the legal parent. It shouldn't be anyone who is not legally related to the patient. And in Ghana, there are clear definitions of who the legal parent is or the legally authorized representative of the subject is. Now, you, you would, when you come to children, they are even placed into another category called the vulnerable populations because you would, they, they, they do not have the, 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 
the opportunity to make the informed choice. They do not have the opportunity to even give assent before the appearance. So everything is done through them. So in the design of the research work, we try to make sure that the protection, the safety is built within the design of the proposal and the protocol, such that if you would have to take blood samples from the child, if it's a longitudinal study and you're, you, you would want to take 50 mils of blood per each episode of visit, it will not be allowed by the ethics committee. The ethics committee is, 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 is composed such that there is a scientist in there, there's a legal officer in there, there's a social person in there, there are people who understand the area of research and they would look at the safety profile of your research work and decide to recommend that for this subject, you are unable to take 50 mils. Your minimum number of mils to take in, in this study population is let's say less than 10 mils. And if you are doing serious blood sampling condition, then it should probably every quarter or by annually that you would take them. We built all these safety guards within the research proposal. There are some research proposals that have been turned down because of the frequency of blood letting or the volume of blood that is being collected. And also the incentives that are given to both parents. We always are very careful with the incentive. If the incentive is too high, it becomes a coercion. So for instance, the study team decided that they would give 500 Ghana cities to each rural person who present to the um, site for blood letting. Meanwhile, the average income for these rural dwellers, it lets say 75 Ghana cities um, every month. Now you go in and you want to give them 500 Ghana cities. Then every, every, every family would want to bring their children to take 50 mils of blood samples from them. That is on Ectica. So my recommendation is that as you develop your protocol, design your safety nets within the protocol such that you would not have problems with it ethics review committees in your institution, or if it's the Ghana Health Service, then the Ghana Health Service Ethics Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, to the mile, I have a follow-up yeah. question. Right. This might be a bit of Bob, since I have the opportunity to talk to you. You are a pediatrician. In terms of treatment guidelines, I'm currently studying in Turkey, and I realize that when we are following, especially with lab values, the normal range of values in those labs, the averages in Turkey varies from that of the World Health Organization and that of EU. So usually they have um, specified guidelines for like the ages of children with their regular range of values. In Ghana, do we have a similar Thing, or we always use the WHO standard, the international standards, which I believe might not be a good reflection of our population. Right. Yeah. So, so the 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 in terms of um, guidelines as well as um, reference reference values, um, reference values also are subjected to um, serious clinical research. Um, if you want to develop a reference value for a typical population. First of all, who are your population? What is the definition of your population? Your population's health standard. Because if you, if you have um, a population that you would want to, let's say, have a reference value for hemoglobin levels, and this population is living in areas where there are issues of malaria, iron deficiency, micronutrient deficiency, that population their hemoglobin levels, their mean hemoglobin levels may be a little bit below. So in selecting the population for reference level, you must make sure that this population is a healthy population such that you would have your reference levels developed um, very well. You would have to have a very good sample size such that at the end of the day, you, when you find the mean of that population, that mean will truly represent the population average. Otherwise, you would have a population, you sample the population, but your population sampling was biased. And because you biased the population sample, you would have your mean also biased, and you would be using that to treat your patients and you have 
problems. In Ghana, for some time back, we didn't have reference figures for most of our parameters. For instance, random blood sugar, hemoglobin levels, white cell count, all the parameters for the, but I am aware that institutions like Noguchi and also the Kintampo Research Center have done a lot of population-based references values, which can sometimes be used for research as well as for patient care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, right. Paul have had another question. Okay. Also, but I think that's all school. So probably if I could contact through you, email. If yes, you can you can contact me and we can we can work on that. Um okay. is there Thank is there Lucas, is there any more questions on the chat that we haven't addressed? Okay, there's one here. I can see one question. Uh, then why is a research proposal important in systematic reviews where there are no regulatory and ethics issues? Why is a research proposal important in a systematic review where there are no regulatory or ethics issues? There, 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 there are. There are. You realize that, for instance, you would want to do answer a systematic review question. Um, I, be, I, I believe all of you here are in the Minnesota. and um, you want to find out whether there has been a research or several research that has been done to find out whether HB levels of seven is enough to take a patient to the theater to do a major surgery. And so you'd want to do a systematic review on this. Your findings on this systematic review, if it comes out that you would want to confirm that based on your systematic review, HB of seven is adequate for a major surgery based on your systematic review. It means that this Cochrane review and other review journals are going to, and individuals are going to practice it. If people would want to practice this and it leads to deaths, your reports probably have contributed to this. That is why you would have to, first of all, even when you are writing, you are doing a, a systematic review, your protocol should be subjected to review, peer review, scientific review, as well as ethical review, such that the way you selecting your research articles, the websites you selecting your articles, the repositories that you are selecting your articles would be considered. Are you doing recent articles or 10 years behind or 50 years articles that you are putting together, the volume of articles that you are putting together to come out with your systematic reviews are all information that you need to tell us what it is that you are doing. Then someone will say, this systematic review that was done, that recommended that HB of seven is enough for um, surgery. Let me also do a similar research systematic review and see whether I'll come out with the same findings. Now, if we do not know your protocol that you used, the your other team that would also would want to replicate and also confirm what you found may, may not be able to do it. That is why we always would want to sometimes subject these things into regulatory approvals as well as reviews. Now, the question on, um, does every research study requires ethical approval? Every research work requires ethical considerations, and it's best to submit it to the ethics review board. There are three main questions that you answer, and I'll be talking about it briefly. Safety, respect for autonomy, and benefit. So if you assess your research work, and that this research work, there's minimal harm no harm, the safety profile of this research is very high and the benefit to the society is very high. You can request for a waiver. You can request for expedited review. You understand each and every country has several categories of submission. Request for a waiver, respect for full review, request for partial review, request for expedited review. You, you can request for any of these in order to protect your study participants. 
how do we submit these research protocols for ethical approval in Ghana? So in Ghana, depending on your institution, if you are in K University, you submit it to the K University Ethical Review Board. If Legon, Legon has it, UDS has it, U, U has, has it. If you are in the Ministry of Health institution, <clears throat> Ghana Health Service, <clears throat> you may have to um, submit it to the Ghana Health Service, the ethics committees in Accra, opposite the uh, mental health um, hospital. Noguchi has it, and most of the institutions in Ghana have, and they all have an online application process that you can go on and, and submit. <clears throat> it says, um, where and who constitutes the board? I think I've answered that. Yeah, so far, that's all the questions. Um, <coughs> for those okay. who have, still have extra questions on the ethical review, um, we tackled the topic last month. Um, you can find the video on our YouTube channel. <coughs> okay, so some of the areas to look at. <coughs> if your research is too difficult, the area you are researching is a, it, the disease is very rare, too complex. Your research question is already known. A typical example, you want to find out whether um, Fasmodium fasparum would cause severe malaria in children. It's already known. You, you find it difficult to define even what you want to do. Your research will take a long time to manifest. These are areas that the reviewers will look at. <clears throat> you would have to submit your schedule of work and they can decide that your work, because of your busy nature, you are unable to do this work. And the work is classified as on, on ethical. And I have given some examples. Prevalence of HIV in, in, in patients with AB negative. You take over 20 years to get AB negative patients and you will not be able to do it. When you come to the ethics, which we spoke about, the researcher and the participants, integrity is very important, competence is very important, the benefits, autonomy, privacy, confidentiality are areas that you must pay attention to. The research is, is huge with ethical issues, and you would want to protect your research participants, and therefore, as I said, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice must be always be at yeah, the background. Vulnerable population, minority populations, patients who are displaced are all issues that you must write on in your proposal. What are the ethical issues? The area is already known. You need to make sure it's simple, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's relevant, and it's, there's time bound. So the SMART principle always works. Don't take a question that is too vague. Some research questions are very difficult to answer. Is ectopic pregnancy more common in light-skinned women than in dark-skinned women? How are you going to do it? How are you going to uh, confirm this? So there are certain research questions that you wouldn't even submit for ethical review. Your work should be achievable. The incidence of West Nile virus and P24 antigen in donated blood units in the National Blood Transfusion Center in Harare. First of all, is West Nile disease in Harare, or even if it's in Ghana. So look at your research area, whether you can achieve it before you submit it. Relevant to the area, relevant to the society is very, very important. And the time limit should be considered all the time. There's enough literature around for you to pay attention to. Do a lot of literature search using the online platforms and be able to get a very good research topic, align your research aims, objectives based on it. And this is the only way that you can avoid some of the common mistakes. Now, just a little bit on the funding agencies that will review these proposals. 
We have the TDR, we have the EDCTP, we have the Malaria Medical Research Council. And when they sent out the, 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 the call, read the background very carefully, the scope of research work that they would want to give to you several times and go and come as you are writing your proposal, go back to the scope. Um, am I aligned to their scope? Otherwise, you would deviate the impact. What is it that they would want us to do? Submission and evaluation process. Look at this. 6 August 2015, 17 hours CET, central or whatever time, or 16 hours GMT. Do not confuse this. 16 hours, 16 hours, 10 minutes, don't submit. You always would have to submit your proposals on the 5th of August, 2015, anytime, or 15, um, 3rd August, 2022, submit it a day before so that you are relaxed. And then you can even go back and look at the work that you have submitted and you have issues you would have to submit. The, if you delay the last minute, it will be over 200 people submitting it into the same web link and the web link may be slowed down and you'll be unable to submit your research work. You pay attention to all the things that they would want you to do. And so what it does is you print this out, you underline some key areas, and you go back and front, you go back to make sure that you would, you are covering the grounds of which the research funding agency requires from you. All these are information that I've mentioned as to where the European Union, the World Health Organization, the US agencies, they all support, even in Ghana, KNUSC have a support research grant, a course that comes on every year by annually that we can submit to. It will either come as request for proposal RFE or request for application RFE or notice of funding availability, NOFA. And so when you are doing the online search, put in any of these and the area that you would want to research in, you would find you get information in. And these are some of the information calls that the, it's every day. Now we've moved even from malaria, TB, diarrhea, diseases, pneumonia, and COVID grants are coming up. So those of you who are interested in infectious disease can go online, ask your research questions, form your consortium, form your team, and write the research proposals. These are the first call that came from the KNUST. Now they, I think they are on the 11th call that um, is out for people to apply for. Thank you very much. And I'm ready to take your comments and your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Um, does anyone have a question? If you can um, kindly post it in the chat or raise your hand. If, if there are no questions, what I would recommend is that um, forming the networks is a good thing to do. Um, getting research grants, if incision can be able to look out for the calls that are coming in every month, package the calls, submit it to the groups for them to look at. That will be, they can establish peer review groups within their groups so that when these grants are, are, are written or in the process of writing, they can share what they are writing so that they would have the peer review before it goes to the experts for the experts to, to comment on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for this recommendation. I'll follow up with um, email or um, I thank everyone who has made it to this um, webinar. Um, we'll have our next webinar series on um, data collection on the 29th of of July, coming on Friday to July of July. Hope to see you all. Uh, <laughs> Professor Danny Anson and Alice, we thank you so much for making time to be with us and to help us improve on our research skills. Um, I think we come to the end of the yeah. now. And just one Have more thing. Yes. 
Yeah, Dokas. So for those in the um, systematic review track, we'll be having a question and answer session on the courses you've done on 28th <clears throat> at 8 p.m. Ghana time. So if you've not completed the course, obviously you may not have the, you will not have the link to, to this and we'll say bye to you from the program. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Same to you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Joshua.